Welcome to Open Door. My guest this morning is Dr. Vanessa Johnson. She is an associate professor in applied psychology at Northeastern University. And she's someone that I have known for several years. And I don't want to say how many, but I'm sure that those facts will be disclosed somewhere in the course of our conversation. Welcome to Open Door, Vanessa. Hi, Vince. Thank you. Yes. Good to be here. It's an extreme pleasure for me to have you here. And uh, I, I always start off by talking about transparency. We were students at Kent State University way back in the previous century. Uh, our paths have uh, taken us to different places, some of those places in common, but they have brought us back together today. Uh, this is Women's History Month, and I thought it was very important to have female guests because folks might be saying, well, you always have dudes on. So let's flip that a little bit. So I'm glad to have you as my guest. Uh, so since we, we were uh, students at Kent State University, I'm going to give you a chance to catch us up with what happened after you left. And we left somewhere. I, I know I left in 1980. So we got a lot of ground to cover. Okay, I guess I left, and let's see, I stayed to get my master's, which I finished in 81, and then I stayed to work for the university till 83, I believe, and then um, I went on to uh, work for a little bit in Cleveland, not long, and then I moved to Kalamazoo, Michigan for 10 years, and then to Providence, Rhode Island for the last 20 plus years. So um, I've been kind of moving around a little bit. Wow. Rhode Island. Mm. Yeah, I'm, I bet there are probably 0.5% black folk up there. And it takes its toll on you culturally, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Because there's a different kind of black that lives in Rhode Island. And that's another. You, I didn't know. Uh, when I moved to Kalamazoo, Michigan, it was like, going to stay with your cousins because, you know, you're so similar. Midwestern blacks are so similar to each other. And then when I came to Rhode Island, you say, wow, there's another kind of black people that exist. Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> okay. So you mentioned Cleveland and my assumption, it's always that folks grew up in Cleveland when I talk to people who have lived in Cleveland. But uh, you started out in Cleveland? Yes, I did. Okay. So you got to rep your hood. Oh, yeah. East High School, uh, Blue Bombers. East High no longer exists. That's unfortunate. Three days ago, my high school boyfriend passed away of two years. Uh, he was, uh, his name was Chris Russell. And so Cleveland's really been on my mind because of that. Um, he was probably one of the few people that their hearts stayed the same every time I saw him and talked to him. I had talked to him. He was in a nursing home in early January of 2020. He had had his leg amputated, and I had talked to him, and every time I would talk to him, he was still just as innocent. He had this pure heart. Uh, he loved East High. He loved everything Cleveland. He was like me. He loved everything Cleveland. And um, like a lot of people, though, I should say, from uh, East High and Kent State that I went to school with, there's this there's this fondness for life that they seem to have, and he embod he embodied that, and I see that in you, <laughs> running into you in Ghana, and so uh, you just see that in people, and it's and that's why I say it's a different kind of black than being here, and there's this cultural pride that exists. So yeah, East High Blue Bombers okay. loved it. All right. So while we were at Kent State University, I know what kind of brought us together was the Department of Pan-African Studies. What did you study when right. you were at Kent? I was in uh, communications, though. I uh, studied communications. That was another thing uh, that I think we had in, in common. We were both interested in broadcasting. Mm -hmm. And uh, the remember the family tree I used to be executive director of. And I think you worked with me on the family tree. Yeah, I was as a director. Well. I work. I was a director on the family tree. Okay, and I was a producer. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. That's what you sure were, and um, we, that was a good t good team there. We we kept we brought it back to life. Someone told me, and um, 
that was a good time. Yes. So how do you go from telecommunications to uh, applied psychology? Okay, well, Dr. Krause had a lot to do with that because I was going to leave, and I was uh, up for uh, a position, kind of weekend kind of position in Boise, Idaho, but I had a Sunday race because, remember, I had my son my uh, fourth year in college. And so um, I was telling him, and I was trying to say, do I want to take my son away from everybody? And he had been on my mind away from his father who lived in Cleveland and away from my family. And I was telling Dr. Crosby, I was thinking about doing that, but I think I, I might stay and just get a master's degree in something. And he said, good, there's this program, Student Personnel Administration, that uh, is looking for students of color to be in the um, in the program. I think it was an early, it was in the beginning stages. And I was able to get in there, and he said, I'll give you a graduate assistantship. And if you do so, I'll allow you to teach a class for me as a grad assistant, and I designed the Blacks in Media course, and I taught that for two years as a grad student. Wow. That's a heck of a story about Dr. Crosby, who just recently transitioned. Uh, I'm sure I didn't know that. Yes. Uh, within the past, I'd say, three or four weeks, actually, uh, there was a homegoing ceremony for him approximately two weeks ago, and, and his son... Mm -hmm. Uh, Kofi Kimmett was uh, basically his champion. Uh, Kofi told me that Dr. Crosby died in his arms. Oh, wow. And wow. said that they were standing up. I think he was hugging his father, and that's when it happened. Uh, so, uh, But, yeah, Dr. Crosby, has uh, he has transitioned. He's become one of the ancestors. And there have been so many stories about ways that Dr. Crosby affected people's lives um, mm -hmm. the way he affected mine was I only took one course from Dr. Dr. Crosby the whole time I was at Kent and I can't even remember what the name of the class was. I just remember that he taught this thing called the banking concept of education. And after he broke it down in those terms, I was like, I'm done. I'm not, I'm not getting any more degrees. I'm through with education. They pimped me. I didn't appreciate that. And uh, so I don't have to do that. And plus, you know, I was in broadcasting. You know, you don't need a college mm -hmm. degree to be right. a, a news reporter. It helps, mm -hmm. but you don't mm -hmm. have to have it. So I was like, OK, mm -hmm. well, I think I'm done with education. So he you know, that that was the impact that he had on my life in, in, in a certain way. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's really heartening to hear how someone could provide opportunity for for someone and that thing become a springboard to your success. So you wanted to mm -hmm. be uh, in broadcasting as a producer, director, talent or something like right. that. And it, had there been an old for Winfrey, I never would have left broadcasting. It's just that there were no women hardly, especially black women, and there were no producers, black female producers. And we weren't exposed to the kind of thing that this group of students and the last few groups of students have had. So, um, I did it out of convenience because I wanted to, I didn't want to go into a field where it didn't look like we had any say. And so, and I needed to feed my son and I needed to take care of him. And you were t talking about Dr. Crosby. As a matter of fact, Dr. Crosby, if I, if I should say when, I need to quit saying if, the, the Black Power book gets done, it's being de dedicated to him. The first one, other book I'm writing, Contemporary College Student Activism, I'm dedicating to my mom. But and the reason I do the Black Power Movement book to him is because I he you know he planted the seed of consciousness in in me that I really wasn't uh, aware of. I just wanted to go to college when I came, and I didn't know you know you go up you go into the Department of Pan African Studies you get exposed to all the murals and all those kind of things. I never took a class over there other than the Black Drama Workshop, and um, it. Um, and it exposed me, and I never um, was as conscious as I am now. But he planted this seed, and he would just kind of say things that kind of, to be honest, I think I was kind of airheaded kind of thing. It wasn't I was airhead. I just didn't know. I was just happy to be in college because I was a first-generation person. And I would listen to him say things to people and or say things about Malcolm X or say, and it just really, just really sparks 
this interest. If you look at, listen attentively, it's a seed being planted, and it will come out and blossom sooner or later if you set at the feet of Dr. Crosby at any time or it was in his presence at any time. Mm. So having said all that, do you ever regret not having that career in broadcasting? Oh, yeah, I do. And I tell you why, all, because I'm a very creative person, and I'm always thinking of ways to be cre- the best way to do something, or ways to be creative. I um, just like when we went to uh, every, some, um, let me think. When I was a, a, an administrator, I was always in positions where I designed and implemented programs that lend itself to my creative part. I always had to have a creative way and doing a way of expressing myself or adding culture and art and people communicating. Um, I've designed probably in my lifetime probably about 20 classes to teach because I'm always thinking of a way. Even the Black Power book, I've designed a course in it. And uh, contemporary student activism, I'm always looking at ways of presenting information to way, in contemporary ways that make people understand and then what's the best way to do that. Um, of course, I'm teaching this fall. It's going to be called um, uh, Childhood Adversity and Its Impact on Higher Education Achievement. And I did that looking at my own background, looking at how I grew up in Cleveland, and looking at all the you, uh, all the things that's happened with George Floyd and reading some, and I was already designing the course, but after he died, I was reading some of the Washington Post articles on him, and they did this thing called uh, A Knee on His Neck, and it looks at his life and a uh, reckoning that came about because uh, <clears throat> that he brought about in his ex- and, and the fact that it exposed us so much to um, the poverty and things that people had to overcome and why somebody like George Floyd, Floyd, as brilliant as he was, if you listen to what people said about him, he was pretty brilliant. He wasn't able to overcome some of the things that he was up against because of where he was born. So I've designed a course on childhood adversity, looking at poverty, looking at incarceration, and looking at um, mental health and um, problems in the family and how that affects how people can achieve anything in their life. So I'm always looking for a way of, a creative way of, of addressing a contemporary issue. That's interesting. You know, and when I think about George Floyd, and I'll be honest with you, I don't watch a whole lot of news or, or read a whole bunch of newspapers, but, you know, they, many of those uh, stories that you heard about him, they depicted him as a, a crackhead security guard or somebody who was addicted to mm-hmm. opioids or something like that. But you, uh, you're you presenting a different picture of him, which I think is relevant in light of the, the impact that he has mm-hmm. had on the world mm-hmm. and the reaction mm-hmm. to his unjust death. You're listening to Open Door on 95.9 FM WOVU. My guest is Dr. Vanessa Johnson. She's an associate professor in applied psychology at Northeastern University. And we're going to continue with our conversation with her about things related to Pan-Africanism and her career there at Northeastern when we come back. We'll be right back. You're listening to Open Door with Vince Robinson. My guest is Dr. Vanessa Johnson, Associate Professor in Applied Psychology at Northeastern University. So before we took the break, we were talking about the ironies in the life of uh, George Floyd. And I'd like to dig a little bit into that because I didn't have the benefit of the research that you did about his life. Uh, I'm just curious, you know, what, what did you find out about him? Well, I found out he, you know, he they had used him as many of these systems do to get good in sports, and they don't push the academic intellectual development of these students, their cognitive development. And we, you know, we're proud of them. We want them to have state championships and all that kind of stuff. But what do we do to make sure they are able to make a living in their life and achieve their goals? He played football and in college and didn't do well. And and so people don't make sure they're okay. If I had my way, you would not be allowed to go to college and play college sports unless they guaranteed you can stay as long as you can to graduate. Even if you get hurt, even if um, um, you um, 
don't want to play anymore, that if they could, they have to commit to letting you graduate because to me, they pull people in and they drop them when they can't do well in sports. And George, I thought about that. Another thing I wanted to mention is at the time I created the course, and one of the reasons I created the course was the SAT was considering having what's called a, a diver, a, a adversity index, meaning that besides the other indicators that they have, like how your test score, they were going to have an index based on what kind of adversity you had in your childhood. That way, your, it would it affect your uh, score, and it would be taken into consideration. So if you grew up with a parent that was incarcerated, if you grew up in an educational uh, system that was not to par as some of the other schools, if you grew up with um, a parent that was abused, all those things would be part of the things they would consider as part of, with the SAT. To me, that was important. And but people, of course, those people in power and people that are already going to do okay, nixed it and they rebelled against it and they had they changed their mind about it. To me, that was such a fair assessment because people don't come t- don't take those tests on a level playing field, having had the same educational training or anything. So I was so excited about that that that's why I wanted to design this course. And then when George Floyd's death came along, and I read about his life. He is the epitome of why they were having this adversity score. And they they took that away because it would help people like him. Mm-hmm. So you have opened another can of worms, and that is education reform. Obviously, from your perspective as mm-hmm. a professor, there are some things that need to be changed. Uh, what other things are you noticing within that, that field that, that need to be addressed? Um, and. My daughter teaches at a charter school, but I'm anti-charter school. And I think because you're supposed to give public schools, and, you know, there's this big movement um, to have all these charter schools, and they're doing fine. But you you shouldn't have needed charter schools. We should have did for students through public schools what we're doing in charter schools. And so I'm anti that. My my daughter works for one. My son, one of my children graduated from one. And he it was a STEM one, and he did pretty well. And I I could tell by the education that they were giving him that he was going to be he was getting what he needed for college to go to college to be trained. So I'm, I'm anti that. I'm also anti. Uh, I mean, poor music and arts and sports and bands and all those kinds of things being placed back into the school system that educated me, who grew up in the ghetto of Cleveland, but we had all those things in place. So by the time I went to college, even though I had to struggle, I got 1.7 my first semester at Kent State, and I didn't even want to go to college. My mother said, go try it a year. If you don't like it, come back home. So I decided that um, I went there, and I got a 1.7. And I'm a competitive person now. I could leave Kent State. That would have been fine if I didn't want to go. But I wasn't going to flunk out. My image, my whole image wasn't going to let that happen. So I just started uh, thinking about how I could study and do this so I could leave on my own terms. And, of course, I wound up staying. So I think that strengthening our public schools, returning them back to where they were, or even better, in some neighborhoods is, is what I would argue and advocate for. Mm. How does Vanessa Johnson get a 1.7? What well, were she, you doing, child? When, in high school, she was busy being cute, being a cheerleader. You know, it's just cute paper. You know, my boyfriend was captain of the football and the basketball team. I was into all that kind of stuff. All that was, you know, everything else was not my priority. But when I got to college, um, I, I just all of a sudden started taking education seriously. And the only reason I got a 1.7 is because I hadn't learned the rhythm of studying for college. I was still applying high school techniques to studying for college. You know, we before I went, to, we didn't learn all of the writing and how you write a research paper, all those kind of things in public schools. Um, at that time, they weren't uh, pushing it the way they are now. They weren't pushing the SATs the way they are now. As a matter of fact, when I remember the day before I graduated Kent State, someone had mentioned to me, that you could go look at your files, you know, back in the day when everything was in a, on a sheet of paper in a manila folder, and um, at your, your academic files. So I went over to the Department of 
uh, fine and professional arts, and I asked to see my folder. I told him I was graduating. And I looked at my ACT, because I took the ACT test, and it had predicted, they had this little level that I was not going to graduate. So the day before I graduated, it had, I looked at this folder, and it said that I was not going to graduate. You know, it kind of gave an estimate. Um, and But at that time, though, Vince, they had what was called the open admission policy, where if you went to a state school, if you graduate from a state school, High school, you could go, you got admitted to a state college. And I think that's another reform, putting those kind of things back in place, giving people a chance. Because you don't know people like me who get sparked by that. And then having in these institutions of higher education like we had, people in place that if you need to learn how to navigate, because navigating college is so much different than navigating high school, that you need somebody to help you navigate that and to talk to you then you can do that because I have served that, that in that kind of capacity for years with people who were struggling and had to say, okay, what's going on with you? These are black people because they all, they would gra- uh, gravitate to me. So what's going on with you? You know, this is what you're going to have to do. And so, and they've been able to stay and graduate. Okay. So uh, you were talking earlier about uh, entrance exams and whatnot, and, and I know that uh, there has been speculation that they might eliminate entrance exams. Uh, what your, what's your perspective on that, given you've told us that in, in ways they discriminate? Um, I don't have a problem with it. Guess what? This year, they got rid of them because of COVID. And guess what? People are still going to college. Mm, okay. Uh, Since you mentioned that and you also deal with psychology, I've always been curious about how uh, this new hybridized learning process has affected students of color. And what I am hearing is that it is disadvantaging them to a certain extent. Uh, What are your thoughts about the the impact of this new learning system on our students? Okay, I'm not sure what that is. Are you talking about at the high school level or... No, I'm, I'm talking level. about folks being at home learning uh, through a computer. Oh, this, being in the oh yeah. Oh, it's devastating. It's devastating. Humans weren't made to stay at home anyway um, <laughs> for everything. It's just devastating. The students need that interaction. They need that contact. They need the energy of being with their peers. Um, I talk to I'm teaching online now. I have to I teach three classes. And first of all, it was the hardest thing I've done in my life to learn how to teach online through all that stuff you have to learn, all the maps and things you have to learn. But then I teach a course called, that I developed years ago called Relationships in College, where we talk about students, parent, relationship to parents, relationship to the university, romantic relationships, relationship to peers, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, so I have a small group, and they, we talk about this process. And they all three talk about how horrible it is. And these are brilliant young ladies and how um, they just can't, you know, you just, you just don't think the same when you have to think about doing everything online and how you need the the engagement of sitting there in the classroom. And I was telling them how hard it is to me, as much as I don't mind doing Zoom for a meeting sometimes, I really miss reading nonverbals because I could walk, a student would walk in a room, even at the college level, especially because I never had a, more than 15 students in my class uh, when I was teaching undergraduates. And now um, I have 19, I think. But anyway, um, you read nonverbals and when you read their papers and things, and you can tell by um, how they respond to their willingness to respond to things, just like you do it in high school how enthusiastic they are if something else is going on. And some people think, and this is an entry-level kind of class, freshman, sophomore level class, some people think that that's not our business, but as faculty members, it is our business because we had these people commit all these tens of thousands of dollars to this university, and I think we should be committed to making sure they graduate. And college is not just an academic experience it's an emotional experience and for black people it really is because some of them it's the first time they've been outside of their comfort zone where they're in the um minority even though they we're in a minority group in the country but many of them they have their support systems that get them through and be able to navigate this and then they go into what i consider and this is probably not the right term a white world 
And then, like I said for myself, sometimes you have to learn differently. And um, so you need somebody there. And faculty, me, to me, should be able to do that and read that and uh, be that for people. Okay. You also talked about uh, public schools versus uh, charter schools, and it, it mm-hmm. seems as though public schools are setting students up for failure. What can public schools learn from charter schools? Um, what can public schools learn from charter schools? Yeah, I mean, how how, how okay. could it be? No, I'm, I'm trying to think of better yeah. what I want to say. Charter schools learn from well-established public schools what to do. So do the same same things for public schools. Well, I, I'm here, you know, there's a town here near me in Providence called Barrington, Rhode Island, where all the students are guaranteed success, a rich community and everything. And I look at all the, sometimes I read what the students are doing on, pay, in, the, on in the paper, especially when I was raising my own children. And then you know they're getting so many more advantages. Well, give those two there. I look at LeBron James School, perfect example of what we need to do. And so um, just just care and just think about how, just tell them what they're going to be and also make sure they are able to be that. Mm-hmm. We know what it takes to get people in college. We know what it takes for them to succeed in life. Just do that. Teach them. They shouldn't have to go to a charter school to be taught that stuff. Now, I have to admit, some of us, along the way, especially in the 80s, we got off track as a race in some communities. And so we had all this welfare reform. We had all those drugs put into our communities. And so it took took us off. And so we had these babies raising babies um, and who, during the crack epidemic, during the um, mass drug incarceration uh, epidemics and all those kinds of things, three strikes you're out, all that stuff. And so it devastated our communities. And we got off track and then everybody was condemning us for something that was really done to us as a community. And we just, this is a public um, school system that was affected. And it happened to our cities, and we have not been able to to get them back. Yes. There are some that might argue that there has been intentionality in that whole paradigm, but... That's uh, what I'm saying. It was on purpose. Yes. It was by design. Yes, yes. And unfortunately... Listen, Vince, we were making so many strides in the 70s. Right. We were making... And the reason you, you, if you look, I'm an MSNBC, I'm a news junkie, but I'm an MSNBC watcher. If you look at all the commentators and the people, the experts they bring on, uh, affirmative action created those people, all these black people, affirmative action created them. Yes. And then. Uh, and, if not. Yeah. And if then, not. Mm. School, HBCUs did. Yeah. They gave us affirmative action, and then they took it away. (laughs) This is a very deep subject, but uh, we'll we'll explore it a bit further when we come back. You're listening to Open Mm -hmm. Door with Vince Robinson and my guest, Dr. Vanessa Johnson from Northeastern University. We'll be back right here on 95.9 FM, WOVU, a Burton Bell Car Community Radio Station. What can you do in the battle against COVID-19? Your first task, wear a mask, protect yourself and others. Armor up, armor up. Give those hands a 20-second shower with soap and water. Armor up, armor up. Give others space six feet just in case. Armor up, armor up. Get good nutrition in jest for digestion. Armor up, armor up. Vitamin C, D3, and more. Elderberries, zinc, and echinacea from the store. Get some fresh air. Go climb some stairs. Let go of stress. Make sure you rest. Your breath is the key to life. Strengthen your immune system, follow the guidelines, and win the battle against COVID-19. Armor up, armor up. We're back. Open Door with Vince Robinson right here on 95.9 FM WOVU. And we are talking about affirmative action. It came, it went, and we were left on the outside once again. 
uh, I can just look back on my life in, in relationship to affirmative action and, and tell you that many of the jobs that I got, in, including my very first job in broadcasting, was a direct result of affirmative action. I uh, took over Wayne Dawson's job at WKNT when I was a student at Kent State University. I was covering, uh, I think it was uh, Talmadge and uh, one other suburb city council meetings. And uh, I left that job. I went to Akron when I graduated from Kent State and I was working at WHLO. And I was the recipient of a Job Training Partnership Act grant that paid half of my salary at Kent. So uh, just about all of the jobs that I got as I was in my formative years were a result of affirmative action, you know. So there have been times when it was necessary to level the playing field by having those kinds of programs, but where things are right now, we really don't have the benefit, perhaps, you know, through the process of reparations or an attempt to to repair the damage that has been done historically in this country to people of color. color. There may be new programs under the new administration, but that remains to be seen. Um, we've talked extensively about education. I'd like to talk about your relationship with Africa now. Uh, as you stated, we saw each other in Ghana. Uh, what took me to uh, Ghana was my connection with Kent State University and a study abroad experience that students there had the opportunity to uh, take part in. Uh, and as I understand it, you are also doing a similar thing. So talk about your uh, involvement in bringing students to Ghana specifically and the educational experience that materializes as a result of that. Well, well, first uh, of all, after I raised my children, I decided every year I'm going to go to a different country in the world. Um, I bought what I call my freedom luggage. <laughs> And I went to London the first year with my one professional association that I belonged to. And then the second year, I went to Ghana. And my heart just relaxed and the way I felt. And then so the third year, everybody knew I loved Ghana because I talked about it to my, even my colleagues that were from Ghana, that were Ghanaian from there. And so you, the university, Northeastern University had decided they were going to have this um relationship with the University of Cape Coast, this agreement, and they need to send a delegation. So they took uh, these, they took one person out of the provost's office and two faculty members out of African American studies. And they took me, <laughs> no relationship at all, because they knew I was so enthused about the country. They, I don't even know how they found out. So they took me and I went over there. And then I found out we have what's called dialogues of civilizations where you could take students Faculty can design these studies to go for four months to go to a country in the world anywhere, and uh, they take two four credit hour courses. And their to it, what's remarkable about it is your tuition for those classes pays for your trip, other than a fee maybe two thousand dollars. And so I you get to do, the faculty get to design the course any way they want to. So I had had these experiences. I had went there, and I designed the, these two credit hour courses, studying education and learning in Ghana. And then um, a couple of years after that, I took a group of students both times uh, for two years straight in 2008. And then uh, a few years after that, I took um, the Ebola crisis hit, and I couldn't take anybody. And then I, I designed, I took a group. And then while I was there, one of my students spilled um, hot water on her leg. And I had to take her to the hospital. <laughs> and uh, she was one of my TAs. Anyway, um, when I was there, the doctor looked at me and her and looked at me judgmentally and said, a Ghanaian woman, mother would never bring her child to the hospital for something like this. In other words, he was calling us wimps over this rough. <laughs> This hot water treatment, and so he said, "You ought to design something around healthcare." And so he and I, this is one of the doctors. He and I started talking, and after that, I designed the second one, um, trip to Ghana, which takes place in July um, every month, year, and then the first one took place in May every year, the education one. And so then I, t and that's my largest one, and we study healthcare and health systems in Ghana for a month. 
And that's how I wound up there. And the part about me needing a creative outlet, this was the perfect match of my skill set, my desire to be creative, and my love of black cultures. So it allowed me to merge all of that together. That is absolutely amazing. Uh, what was it like for you to be in Africa for the first time? You you alluded to it briefly, but uh, tell us what that was like for you. Um, I, I I just knew that I was home, and I you know people say that all the time, but you really get that feeling. And Ghana, I don't know if I can prove it because we can trace on my mother's side. Uh, we know that the original people on her side that came from from Africa where it was a mother and a daughter. And I really believe they must have been Ghanaian. I always tell people my light skin and all this stuff and my sometimes uh, dry sense of humor means I probably was British, <laughs> mm. <laughs> the white people. <laughs> but, but but when I went to Ghana, I'm from West Africa. I don't care. And, I, and I, I feel like I'm at home. And I haven't went anywhere else. So I didn't continue my pursuit of going to any other countries because I fell in love with Ghana. And I actually have no desire to ever visit any other country than, than there. Wow. And that's weird. But <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll share this. Uh, on one of those trips to uh, Ghana, I was uh, in the process of coming back to America, and I was at the airport, and I had tears streaming down my face and didn't mm-hmm. really fully understand why uh, until I got back. And I realized mm-hmm. the reason for my tears was that I was leaving home and I had to come back here mm-hmm. to America. So mm-hmm. it's very. And so you understand what I'm talking about. You know, your you know, your home. I remember looking at them and saying, Dag, I look at the way women put the hand on the hip. Ain't that the way black Southern women used to do mm-hmm. while they were doing one thing? They got the hand on the hip with the other. The way they, you know, the way they walk around coming out of those houses could be made out of something natural to the environment. They come out of there looking fine as hell <laughs> with their little dresses. They done sold together, you know, in their hair, black women in America, that's us. So people used to criticize, uh, welfare mothers and teen mothers who would be pushing a stroller, but their hair would be hooked up in their outfit. And I said, they can't help themselves. They're African. We don't, you know, black women don't play with their crowns. That's the way they are and the way they look. That's just who we, that's just who we are. Mm -hmm. Since you brought that up, can you talk about the parallels between the experiences of African-Americans and and Africans who have been affected by systems of colonialism, uh, segregation, Jim Crow, and uh, domestic terrorism? Hmm. Let me see. That's a big one. I, uh, you know, I, I think that, um, what I see most in, um, and this is just me going to Ghana. I haven't been to any of the other countries. Senegal or maybe different. Um, I know that um, I see a lot of the British effect on Ghanaian um, culture. And also, I should people may get mad at me, but the Christian effect. And it's also, it, to me, in some ways, it has kept them from becoming the great world power, but that's by design too. Um, you know, Ghana was one of the few countries that didn't have to have a war to get their so-called independence. And they are independent in a lot of ways, but they're not independent in the sense of they couldn't have a Stokely Carmichael or Louis Farrakhan or even an Al Sharpton over there. Cause you know, talking about the truth of anything systemic. I look at, um, I, I remember going in um, 2006, and we went to a traditional medicine hospital. And so one of the doctors, herbal medicine people, said that they had to the cure for AIDS. He said, but the pharmaceutical companies won't let them do that. He said, and I'm not supposed to be telling you this, and I'm saying this because it's years later now. And I remember thinking how oppressed they are from being able to say what they really want to do and how in so many ways he was saying that we um, can't really make our contribution to the world because they are people, it doesn't benefit them. And then I think about how they discovered that oil, what, about eight years ago, Mm -hmm. and how most of the oil is not owned by Ghanaians. Right. And so those are the kind of things that concern me. And then even now with the uh, coronavirus, 
going on. So whenever I do presentations for students who are interested in going to Ghana, I always give the COVID numbers compared to America and compared to the world. Well, when America was at 300,000, Ghana was at like 300-some deaths when they were at 300-some thousand mm-hmm. deaths. So they were always 0.01% of the deaths we had. Yet, they're getting ready to go in there and give that vaccine to all those people. I have a problem with that, to be honest. Yes. Well, I got an email sent to me by my in-country coordinator over there that helps me uh, with planning this trip. And, and, you know, I can't go over there telling my problem, telling them my objections. But that concerns me. If they're doing well, shouldn't we be learning from them as opposed to us taking those, those vaccines over there? If this was a Facebook post, you would see eyes it would just be the eyes because i wouldn't be saying anything but you would know what i was thinking and Mm -hmm. i i I fully agree with you you know i brought that up in a show that i did with two uh folks who are living there right now uh a sister named connie addison who went over there maybe three years ago and uh she found her prince and now she's living there full time you know and i asked them how many people have died? And they said, well, it's been about 515 people. And I said, how many people live in Ghana? He's, and they said 50 million people. I'm like, wow. So how can we describe that as an epidemic? It's not, you know, but on the other hand, uh, Ghana is charging people $150 to take a COVID test on the way in and another $150 to take a COVID test on the way out, you know? So, I I just, you know, I have a problem with that. But on the other hand, the president of the country went to Europe and told the Swiss that we're not going to send you our cocoa anymore. And we're going to develop uh, our cocoa industry here in Ghana. And then we'll send you the products. So, you know, you see progress. I don't blame it. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. I don't blame it. Yeah. But I'm just saying you see good on one hand. and But then on the other Mm -hmm. hand, you see that issue. And then you look at Tanzania, the Tanzanian president said no to the vaccine. And then what happens at the age of 61 mysteriously? And suddenly he has a heart attack. Really? I didn't know that. Yes. That, that's something. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. They, you know, they're getting ready to give all those Ghanaians that vaccine. That bothers me so much. The president signed on to that over there. I just see those are the kind of things that concern me. And Vince, we want to talk about the plastic mm-hmm. <laughs> in a place so beautiful. Yes. And so, you know, I just feel like those pla- the plastics were just shoved on them. You know, I can't prove it. Um, I just, you know, sometimes I worry about the judgment over there. Mm-hmm. And so and who's making these decisions. And then there was a time when you drive around there, which I thought was really funny. Now, you don't hear the politicians over there making any kind of broad statements, international statements of uh, other government. But then you drive around and you you see these things on the wall saying, stop the corruption in the government. So you're going to be, you know, it looks bad. You know, kind of, so what are you saying? We can attack our own for their wrongdoings, but we can't attack the interna- on an international scale people who are doing wrong to us. Mm, it kind of sounds like America. <laughs> Let's uh, take a pause there and come back to it. You're listening to Open Door on WOVU 95.9 FM. Uh, We're talking to Dr. Vanessa Johnson, and she is an associate professor in applied psychology at Northeastern University. We'll be back after this. We're rounding third and headed home right here on Open Door with Vince Robinson and my guest, Dr. Vanessa Johnson. Uh, Before we took the break, we were just talking about certain realities uh, in Ghana. A president who says, no, we're not going to uh, ship you any more of our cocoa. But on the other hand, he's saying we're going to have everybody take a COVID test on the way in and on the way out. And it's very obvious that there is a global system that is taking place in this world right now. And it's connected to the pharmaceutical industry and profit is one of the motives in that paradigm or that scenario. I'm convinced of it. And I'm sure that there are folks who will disagree with me, but I say, when you want to understand things, follow the money and you will get a clear understanding of the agenda at hand. But 
despite all of that, uh, we are going back and forth now. They are easing up some of the travel restrictions. I know President Biden uh, has, has talked about easing up some travel restrictions uh, come May. So we'll uh, look to see what happens with that. And then, you know, we're looking at the country overall and, and some of the pushback on some of the restrictions that have uh, been put in place in order to stem the, the flow of this uh this pandemic that uh, we've been navigating through. Uh, Can you talk a bit more about uh, some of the experiences and uh, things that have happened as a result of your trips to Ghana? Well, a few things. One thing that we did, um, I had, I remember going, doing a recognizance visit there to set up and plan the class and everything. And uh, one of the places I visited was, um, Church of Christ School in Cape, in Cape Coast is a pri- is a, what they call it, primary school. Anyway, so I was sitting there talking to the teacher, and she and I asked her, "What can we do for you?" Because I knew I don't care what we were going to have a service learning component to this class. We were not. Do, I'm not going to take these students, most of them almost almost all white, over there and let them you know have an enriching experience, and then we don't leave something there. And um, so we, I, so she was telling me how they needed a computer lab. And she showed me this room that was dirt floor. And she had a little bucket. They had a few little tiles. You know, Ghanaians use everything they have that would be floor tiles. And so um, I said, you know what, I'm going to do what I can. And so we spent, I spent the next three years with people donating computers and then doing what's called the Husky Starter Fund, where people can... Um, give money and we purchase computers. So anyway, people donated computers. One of my students, her father owned a um, culinary school in New York. When he uh, phased out his computers, he gave them to us. And so I would actually go to the Goodwill, buy suitcases <laughs> and student people would see me pull them up the street to my office. And outside my office would be like 30 suitcases. And we would buy these computers, new and used. People would donate them, laptop, desktop, wrap them up in all this bubble wrap. And my students, because you can check in two luggages, would check in one. They are, or and we t- also took um, hygiene kits and we took um, uh, sports equipment and clothing and things. Anyways, for this, but I'm gonna look at this particular school anyway. Um, so when I went there the first time, we only had one computer. Next time we had uh, just two more computers. And then I, one time I felt so bad we didn't have anything. I went on another cognitive visit. So I just bought them a projector. And then the computer started rolling in and they, they, they wound up having the, they wound up setting it up and then they purchased some, over, took the money we had and purchased some over in Ghana. So now this school has a computer lab. And it's important because when those students go from primary school to high, junior high school, they have to take this test. Well, they didn't have computers, and they take the test on computers. They had the keyboard drawn on brown paper, and on the bulletin board, was, on the chalkboard was a, a, a computer. And that's how they learned computer. And then when they went to take the test, the only time they actually, it was the first time they actually touched a computer, and they would have to take the test on that. So in a, in a small way, we've helped these young these young people be able to take this test and be prepared to do that. Yes. So that's one of my major accomplishments. Plus we take brailers to the school for the blind and we do all that kind of stuff. Wow. So you, you see how we in this country are able to have a positive impact on our brothers and sisters across the pond. Uh, Could you talk about some of the uh, misperceptions or, uh, you know, the, the, the flawed thinking that we have about our, our neighbors on the other side of the world? Oh, that they're, li- that, you know, there's still people saying they live in huts, uh, that they're ignorant, uh, that Africa has n- not given anything to the world when Africa gave us civilization, um, that um, they, they're they cheesy. In other words, they had those big grins on their face because they, they're not that intelligent. Um, that... The other one is the Africans don't like us. Well, I tell them I have five kids, and to be honest, once I tell them that, they always call me Mama Africa. Mm-hmm. So I love, I love that. But anyway, um, so those they always negative misconceptions about them, and and here it is, and you've seen this. Those cities are really evolving, 
and they're very sophisticated over there. You know, I think I, sometimes I think they don't appreciate we appreciate more of their culture than they do, uh, which is not true. But sometimes we're like, don't you see how beautiful you are? And, and another thing, though, is uh, in a little reverse of what you said is I think that Africans don't understand what what has happened to us over here in the last 400 years. And if I had my, if I was younger and had the money, I would try to create something comparable to the African American History Museum over there, so they can see, because they take us from the slave ship forward. I would like to take us from um, captive to forward over there, to, so they can see what happens to us. Mm, that would be critical. That would be mm-hmm. amazing because they don't have a, they have no clue. Let me tell you real quick. I hope I can say this to you. I went, took my students on a tour of Jamestown, you know, where the thing is. And so the young man gave a tour and he had the nerve to say that the women, he showed a little area, you know, it's really run down area that they built in the, 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 the guys who were in the slave castle near there had built for the women. They had babies, you know, those were their wives and stuff. And I said, and I called them to say, those were not their wives. Those are their concubines. <laughs> what do you, <laughs> you can't say that. And I told him, he, and then he, t- then they decided to give us a slave auction where he take three of his little assistants and say, how much would you pay for this one? And I had to say to him when that was over, they probably, I'm surprised they haven't kicked me out of Ghana. You, slavery was not funny. There was nothing funny about this. And they didn't get to laugh and go home afterwards. This was not, you know, it was like a mockery. And this was Ghanaians doing that. That pissed me off so bad. And so that's when I was thinking, I wish I could show them exactly what this 400 years has been for us on this side so they can know this is what happened to our our people. Yes, that absolutely needs to happen. Uh, Yeah, because they think we didn't get rich over here. Yeah, they do. I mean, I remember having a conversation with someone in a neighboring village uh, to my home village of Atonqua. And he was talking to me like, you know, I just had six or seven thousand dollars laying around to pay for airplane tickets for him and his children to come to America so he could find a job. I'm like, bruh, you come to America, you're going to be standing in line with other people trying to get the same job. You get (laughs) it. But, you know, Mm -hmm. the fact that he is African might mean that he might have an advantage because they treat Africans differently than they treat us over here. They do. But they really do. I I I digress. I wanted to talk another conversation. Yeah, it is. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, But I also wanted to give you an opportunity to talk about the books that you have uh, in progress. Let's let's talk about this 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 content that you're creating because when you told me about it the first time I I was absolutely fascinated. Uh, talk about okay. your book projects. Okay, one of them is called Contemporary Student Activism, where it looks at college student activism just in um, in all aspects, like the war on Vietnam protests, uh, students for a democratic society, free speech movement, and all of that. And that looks at, and then looks at how um, students protest and engage, looking at divestment issues and all those kind of things. And I'd also look at the student. To me, activism has is protest, but it's also what students sign up to do with their time when it comes to bettering, bettering humankind. Then the other one is the Black Power Movement book, which looks at Black Power um, from its beginning and it's about how black power changed higher education higher education we know it now did not happen until the 1960s just like america uh, as we know it now didn't happen in my contemporary um costume activism book didn't happen until even the white students pushed america to be more democratic than they are now and each one of these books i bring it up to the black power movement and how it has changed and george Floyd um, issues have changed and how activism has changed in in the in the face of technology and all of these other things and what motivates change. Interesting. Interesting. Um, I'm sitting here thinking about leadership on both sides of the globe. And I think on both sides of the globe, 
to a great extent, our leadership has failed us. You know, we we spoke of uh, Kufu Otto, you know, and his relationship to the vaccine and the coronavirus and all of that. And then you come over here to America and you, you see that, you know, black leadership is not united in any sense of the word. You look at the Congressional uh, Black Caucus and you see how ineffective they are right now in terms of representing the needs and the plight of African-Americans in this country. Uh, what do you think will happen or do you think it will happen that our leadership gets to a place where they really stand up for us and, uh, you know, they discontinue the sellout that happened at, uh, you know, the conclusion of the 70s and, and up until where we are now? I think, to be honest, I'm more hopeful. I look at, um, well, they're fighting for this voting rights stuff. You know, it's Jim Crow thing with these few people with money trying to take back. You know, white people just having a hard time living with the words and living up to the words that the Constitution has. And the riots have proven that. They don't care what happens. This, they've never wanted this land to be what they said it was in the Constitution if white people can't rule. So that's very obvious. You know, and then we had the nerd elected by black president, then a, a black vice president. So, you know, so we're not going to do that. I think um, I'm more hopeful, though, as I watch the people who talk and I look at the Black Lives Matter movement and I look at some of the things that people have tried to change and corporations and what they're doing with HBCUs, even though I hope that doesn't mean they're going to get rid of them. Um, they're giving HBCUs all this money and all these uh, uh, agreements and corporations and things because of George Floyd. And it's almost as if everybody's saying, okay, we now get it now. We're going to do something. We have been unfair. You know, I remember one of the uh, newspapers in Kansas apologized for the way they covered black people since forever. Mm -hmm. So people are making these, they're coming along making these kind of decisions. So to me, that makes me hopeful. But I also think about places like the Ford Foundation and all these corporations, a few of them, much less than now, gave money during the civil rights movement. Look what has happened. So uh, as people are beginning to want to do more for blacks, then you have people oppressing the black vote. So, you know, I'm, I, I'm hopeful. I think we're on the right track. Um, but I also don't know if we don't really act a fool about this Voting Rights Act. I don't know if all of this stuff is going to be undone or not. But we're doing better to me than we were even in the, in, with the outcome of the, of the 60s. Okay. When you think about it, there's so many more educated of us. There's so many more millionaires. You know, look at what LeBron James has done with his life. Brilliant. Brilliant use of his Beyonce and Jay-Z. We have all these people doing these things now. Okay. Well, we're going to end it on a hopeful note and uh, pray that your vision comes into fruition. Uh, Dr. <laughs> Vanessa Johnson, it has been a pleasure to have this conversation with you. Thanks for joining us on Open Door. Thank you for having me. And thank you for listening. Know yourself, love yourself, be yourself. Make today your best day. Peace.